Act Four of Quality Street by J. M. Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, The Blue and White Room. If we could shut our eyes to the two sisters sitting here in woe, this would be, to the male eye at least, the identical blue and white room of ten years ago the same sun shining into it and playing familiarly with miss susan's treasures but the ladies are changed it is not merely that miss phoebe has again donned her schoolmistress's gown and hidden her curls under the cap to see her thus once more her real self after the escapade of the ball is not unpleasant and the cap and gown do not ill become the quiet room but she now turns guiltily from the son that used to be her intimate her face is drawn her form condensed into the smallest space and her hands lie tremblingly in her lap it is disquieting to note that any life there is in the room comes not from her but from miss susan if the house were to go on fire now it would be she who would have to carry out miss phoebe whatever of import has happened since the ball patty knows it and is enjoying it we see this as she ushers in miss willoughby note also with concern that at mention of the visitor's name the eyes of the sister turn affrightedly not to the door by which their old friend enters but to the closed door of the spare bedchamber patty also gives it a meaning glance then the three look at each other and two of them blanch miss willoughby the fourth to look at the door i am just run across susan to inquire how miss livy does now she's still very poorly mary i am so unhappy of that i conceive it to be a nervous disorder miss susan almost too glibly accompanied by tremblings flutterings and spasms the excitements of the ball you have summoned the apothecary at last i trust phoebe miss phoebe once so ready of defence can say nothing miss susan to the rescue it is livy's own wish that he should not be consulted miss willoughby looking longingly at the door may i go in to see her i fear not mary she is almost asleep and it is best not to disturb her peeping into the bedroom lie quite still livy my love quite still somehow this makes patty smile so broadly that she finds it advisable to retire miss willoughby sighs and produces a small bowl from the folds of her cloak this is a little arrowroot of which i hope miss livy will be so obliging as to partake miss susan taking the bowl i thank you mary phoebe ashamed susan we ought not miss susan shameless i will take it to her while it is still warm she goes into the bedroom miss willoughby gazes at miss phoebe who certainly shrinks it has not escaped the notice of the visitor that miss phoebe has become the more timid of the sisters and she has evolved an explanation phoebe has captain brown been apprised of miss livy's illness phoebe uncomfortably i think not miss willoughby miss willoughby sorry for phoebe and speaking very kindly is this right phoebe you informed fanny and henrietta at the ball of his partiality for livy my dear it is hard for you but have you any right to keep them apart phoebe discovering only now what are the suspicions of her friends is that what you think i am doing miss willoughby such a mysterious illness sweetly long ago phoebe i once caused much unhappiness through foolish jealousy that is why i venture to hope that you will not be as i was my dear i jealous of livy miss willoughby with a sigh i thought as little of the lady i refer to but he thought otherwise indeed miss willoughby you wrong me but miss willoughby does not entirely believe her and there is a pause so long a pause that unfortunately miss susan thinks she has left the house miss susan peeping in is she gone miss willoughby hurt no susan but i am going miss susan distressed mary she follows her out but miss willoughby will not be comforted and there is a coldness between them for the rest of the day miss susan is not so abashed as she ought to be 
she returns and partakes with avidity of the arrowroot phoebe i am well aware that this is wrong of me but mary's arrowroot is so delicious the ladies fingers and petticoat tails those officers sent to livy i ate them also once on a time this would have amused miss phoebe but her sense of humour has gone she is crying phoebe if you have such remorse you will weep yourself to death oh sister were it not for you how gladly would i go into a decline miss susan after she has soothed phoebe a little my dear what is to be done about her we cannot have her supposed to be here for ever we had to pretend that she was ill to keep her out of sight and now we cannot say she has gone away for the miss willoughby's windows command our door and they are always watching miss susan peeping from the window i see fanny watching now i feel phoebe as if livy really existed phoebe mournfully we shall never be able to esteem ourselves again miss susan who has in her the makings of a desperate criminal phoebe why not marry him if only we could make him think that livy had gone home then he need never know susan you pain me she who marries without telling all hers must ever be a false face they are his own words patty enters importantly captain brown phoebe starting up i wrote to him begging him not to come miss susan quickly patty i am sorry we are out but valentine has entered in time to hear her words valentine not unmindful that this is the room in which he is esteemed a wit i regret that they are out patty but i will await their return the astonishing man sits on the ottoman beside miss susan but politely ignores her presence it is not my wish to detain you patty patty goes reluctantly and the sisters think how like him and how delightful it would be if they were still the patterns of propriety he considers them phoebe bravely captain brown valentine rising you miss phoebe i hear miss livy is indisposed she is very poorly but it is not that unpleasant girl i have come to see it is you miss susan meekly how do you do valentine ignoring her and i am happy miss phoebe to find you alone miss susan appealingly how do you do sir you know quite well sir that susan is here nay ma'am excuse me i heard miss susan say she was gone out miss susan is incapable of prevarication miss susan rising helpless what am i to do don't go susan tis what he wants i have a word that she is not present oh dear my faith in miss susan is absolute at this she retires into the bedroom and immediately his manner changes he takes miss phoebe's hands into his own kind ones you coward miss phoebe to be afraid of valentine brown i wrote and begged you not to come you implied as a lover miss phoebe but surely always as a friend oh yes yes you told miss livy that you loved me once how carefully you hid it from me phoebe more firmly a woman must never tell you went away to the great battles i was left to fight in a little one women have a flag to fly mr brown as well as men and old maids have a flag as well as women i tried to keep mine flying but you cease to care for me tenderly i dare ask your love no more but i still ask you to put yourself into my keeping miss phoebe let me take care of you it cannot be this weary teaching let me close your school please sir if not for your own sake i ask you miss phoebe to do it for mine in memory of the thoughtless recruit who went off laughing to the wars they say ladies cannot quite forget the man who has used the mill miss phoebe do it for me because i used you ill i beg you no more valentine manfully there it is all ended miss phoebe here is my hand on it what will you do now i also must work 
I will become a physician again, with some drab old housekeeper to neglect me in the house. Do you foresee the cobwebs gathering and gathering, Miss Phoebe? Oh, sir. You shall yet see me in Quality Street, wearing my stock all awry. Oh, oh. And with snuff upon my sleeve. Sir, sir. No skulker, ma'am, I hope, but gradually turning into a grumpy, crusty, bottle-nosed old bachelor. Oh, Mr. Brown. And all because you will not walk across the street with me. Indeed, sir, you must marry, and I hope it may be someone who is really like a garden. I know but one. That reminds me, Miss Phoebe, of something I'd forgot. He produces a paper from his pocket. It's a trifle I have wrote about you, but I fear to trouble you. Phoebe's hands go out longingly for it. Reading. Lines to a certain lady who is modestly unaware of her resemblance to a garden. Wrote by her servant, V. B. The beauty of this makes her falter. She looks up. Valentine, with a poet's pride. There is more of it, ma'am. Reading. The lilies are her pretty thoughts, her shoulders are the may. Her smiles are all forget-me-nots, the paths her gracious way. The roses that do line it are her fancies walking round. Tis sweetly smelling lavender, in which my lady's gowned. Miss Phoebe has thought herself strong, but she is not able to read such exquisite lines without betraying herself to a lover's gaze. Valentine excitedly. Miss Phoebe, when did you cease to care for me? Phoebe, retreating from him, but clinging to her poem. You promised not to ask. I know not why you should, Miss Phoebe, but I believe you love me still. Miss Phoebe has the terrified appearance of a dejected felon. Miss Susan returns. You are talking so loudly. Miss Susan, does she care for me still? Miss Susan, forgetting her pride of sex. Oh, sir, how could she help it? Then by God, Miss Phoebe, you shall marry me, though I have to carry you in my arms to the church. Sir, how can you? But Miss Susan gives her a look which means that it must be done, if only to avoid such a scandal. It is at this inopportune moment that Miss Henrietta and Miss Fanny are announced. I think Miss Willoughby has already popped in. Phoebe, with a little spirit. Yes, indeed. Miss Susan, a mistress of sarcasm. How is Mary, Fanny? She has not been to see us for several minutes. Miss Fanny, somewhat daunted. Mary is so partial to you, Susan. Your servant, Miss Henrietta, Miss Fanny. How do you do, sir? Miss Henrietta, wistfully. And how do you find Miss Livy, sir? I have not seen her, Miss Henrietta. Indeed. Not even you. You seem surprised. Nay, sir, you must not say so. But really, Phoebe. Fanny, you presume valentine puzzled if one of you ladies would deign to enlighten me to begin with what is miss livy's malady he does not know oh phoebe ladies have pity on a dull man and explain miss fanny timidly please do not ask us to explain i fear we have already said more than was proper phoebe forgive to captain brown this but adds to the mystery and he looks to Phoebe for enlightenment. Phoebe, desperate. I understand, sir, there is a belief that I keep Livy in confinement because of your passion for her. My passion for Miss Livy? Why, Miss Fanny, I cannot abide her, nor she me. Looking manfully at Miss Phoebe. Furthermore, I am proud to tell you that this is the lady whom I adore. Phoebe? Yes, ma'am. The ladies are for a moment bereft of speech, and the uplifted Phoebe cannot refrain from a movement which, if completed, would be a curtsy. Her punishment follows promptly. Miss Henrietta, from her heart. Phoebe, I am so happy to you. Dear Phoebe, I give you joy. And you also, sir. Miss Phoebe sends her sister a glance of unutterable woe, and escapes from the room. It is almost ill-bred of her. Miss Susan, 
i do not understand is it that miss livy is an obstacle miss susan who knows that there is no hope for her but in flight i think i hear phoebe calling me a sudden indisposition pray excuse me henrietta she goes we know not sir whether to offer you our felicitations valentine cogitating may i ask ma'am what you mean by an obstacle is there some mystery about miss livy so much sir that we at one time thought she and miss phoebe were the same person pshaw sure. why will they admit no physician into her presence the blinds of her room are kept most artfully drawn miss fanny plaintively we have never seen her sir neither miss susan nor miss phoebe will present her to us valentine impressed indeed miss henrietta and miss fanny encouraged by his sympathy draw nearer the door of the interesting bedchamber they falter any one who thinks however that they would so far forget themselves as to open the door and peep in has no understanding of the ladies of quality street they are nevertheless not perfect for miss henrietta knocks on the door how do you find yourself dear miss livy there is no answer it is our pride to record that they come away without even touching the handle they look appealingly at captain brown whose face has grown grave i think ladies as a physician he walks into the bedroom they feel an ignoble drawing to follow him but do not yield to it when he returns his face is inscrutable is she very poorly sir ha huh. we did not hear you address her she is not awake ma'am it is provoking miss fanny sternly just they informed mary that she was nigh asleep it is not a serious illness i think ma'am with the permission of miss phoebe and miss susan i will make myself more acquaint with her disorder presently he is desirous to be alone but we must not talk lest we disturb her you suggest our retiring sir nay miss fanny you are very obliging but i think henrietta miss henrietta rising yes fanny no doubt they are the more ready to depart that they wish to inform miss willoughby at once of these strange doings as they go miss susan and miss phoebe return and the adieus are less elaborate than usual neither visitors nor hostesses quite know what to say miss susan is merely relieved to see them leave but miss phoebe has read something in their manner that makes her uneasy why have they departed so hurriedly sir they they did not go in to see livy no she reads danger in his face why do you look at me so strangely valentine somewhat stern miss phoebe i desire to see miss livy impossible why impossible they tell me strange stories about no one seeing her miss phoebe i will not leave this house until i have seen her you cannot but he is very determined and she is afraid of him will you excuse me sir while i talk with susan behind the door the sisters go guiltily into the bedroom and captain brown after some hesitation rings for patty patty come here why is this trick being played upon me patty with all her wits about her trick sir who would dare i know patty that miss phoebe has been miss livy all the time i give in why has she done this patty beseechingly are you laughing sir i am very far from laughing patty turning on him twas you that began it all by not knowing her in the white gown why has this deception been kept up so long because you would not see through it oh the wicked denseness she thought you were infatuate with miss livy because she was young and silly it is infamous i will not have you call her names it was all playful innocence at first and now she is so feared of you she is weeping her soul to death and all i do i cannot rouse her i have a follower in the kitchen ma'am says i to infuriate her give him a glass of cowslip wine says she like a gentle lamb 
and ill she can afford it you having lost their money for them what is that on the contrary all the money they have patty they owe to my having invested it for them that's the money they lost you are sure of that i can swear to it deceived me about that also good god but why i think she was feared you would offer to her out of pity she said something to miss susan about keeping a flag flying what she meant i know not but he knows and he turns away his face are you laughing sir no patty i am not laughing why do they not say miss livy has gone home it would save them a world of trouble the mrs willoughby and miss henrietta they watched the house all day they would say she cannot be gone for we did not see her go valentine enlightened at last i see and miss phoebe and miss susan wring their hands for they are feared miss livy is bedridden here for all time now his sense of humour asserts itself oh, thank the lord you are laughing at this he laughs the more and it is a gay captain brown on whom miss susan opens the bedroom door this desperate woman is too full of plot to note the change in him i am happy to inform you sir that lily finds herself much improved valentine bolting it is joy to me to hear it she is coming in to see you patty aghast oh ma'am valentine frowning on patty i shall be happy to see the poor invalid ma'am but miss susan believing that so far all is well has returned to the bedchamber a captain brown bestows a quizzical glance upon the maid go away patty anon i may claim a service of you but for the present go but but retire woman she has to go and he prepares his face for the reception of the invalid phoebe comes in without her cap the ringlets showing again she wears a dressing jacket and is supported by miss susan valentine gravely your servant miss livy phoebe weakly how do you do allow me miss susan he takes miss susan's place but after an exquisite moment miss phoebe breaks away from him feeling that she is not worthy of such bliss no no i i can walk alone see she reclines upon the couch how do you think she is looking he makes a professional examination of the patient and they are very ashamed to deceive him but not so ashamed that they must confess valentine solemnly she will recover may i say ma'am it surprises me that any one should see much resemblance between you and your aunt phoebe miss phoebe is decidedly shorter and more thick-set phoebe sitting up no i am not i said miss phoebe ma'am she reclines but tell me is not miss phoebe to join us she hopes you will excuse her sir miss susan vaguely taking the opportunity of airing the room ah of course miss susan opening bedroom door and catting mendaciously captain brown will excuse you phoebe certainly miss susan well ma'am i think i could cure miss livy if she is put unreservedly into my hands miss susan with a sigh i am sure you could then you are my patient miss livy phoebe nervously twas but a passing indisposition i am almost quite recovered nay you still require attention do you propose making a long stay in quality street ma'am i ah uh, i hope not it uh, it depends miss susan forgetting herself mary is the worst i ask your pardon aunt susan you are excited but you are quite right miss livy home is the place for you would that i could go you are going yes soon indeed i have a delightful surprise for you miss livy you are going to-day to-day not merely to-day but now as it happens my carriage is standing idle at your door and i am to take you in it to your home some twenty miles if i remember you are to take me nay it is no trouble at all and as your physician my mind is made up some wraps for her miss susan but but phoebe in a panic 
Sir, I decline to go. Come, Miss Livy, you are in my hands. I decline. I am most determined. You admit yourself that you are recovered. I do not feel so well now. Aunt Susan? Sir! If you wish to consult Miss Phoebe. Oh, no. Then the wraps, Miss Susan. Auntie, don't leave me. What a refractory patient it is. But reason with her, Miss Susan, and I shall ask Miss Phoebe for some wraps. Sir! To their consternation, he goes cheerily into the bedroom. Miss Phoebe saves herself by instant flight, and nothing but mesmeric influence keeps Miss Susan rooted to the blue and white room. When he returns, he is loaded with wraps, and still cheerfully animated, as if he had found nothing untoward in Livy's bedchamber. I think these will do admirably, Miss Susan. But Phoebe! If I swathe Miss Livy in these. Phoebe! She is still busy airing the room. The extraordinary man goes to the couch as if unable to perceive that its late occupant has gone, and Miss Susan watches him fascinated. Come, Miss Lily, put these over you. Allow me. This one over your shoulders, so. Be so obliging as to lean on me. Be brave, ma'am, you cannot fall. My arm is round you. Gently, gently, Miss Livy. Ah, that is better. We are doing famously. Come, come. Good-bye, Miss Susan. I will take every care of her. He has gone with the bundle on his arm, but Miss Susan does not wake up. Even the banging of the outer door is unable to rouse her. It is heard, however, by Miss Phoebe, who steals back into the room, her cap upon her head to give her courage. He is gone. Miss Susan's rapt face alarms her. Oh, Susan, was he as dreadful as that? Miss Susan, in tones unnatural to her. Phoebe, he knows all. Yes, of course he knows all now. Sister, did his face change? Oh, Susan, what did he say? He said, Goodbye, Miss Susan. That was almost all he said. Did his eyes flash fire? Phoebe, it was what he did. He... He took Livy with him. Susan, dear, don't say that. You are not distraught, are you? Miss Susan, clinging to facts. He did. He wrapped her up in a shawl. Susan, you are Susan Throstle, my love. You remember me, don't you? Phoebe, your sister? I was Livy also, you know. Livy. He took Livy with him. Phoebe, in woe. Oh, oh, sister, who am I? You are Phoebe. And who was Livy? You were. Thank heaven. But he took her away in the carriage. Oh, dear. She has quite forgotten her own troubles now. Susan, you will soon be well again. Dear, let us occupy our minds. Shall we draw up the advertisement for reopening of the school? I do so hate the school. Come, dear, come sit down. Right, Susan. Dictating. The Mrs. Throstle have the pleasure to announce... Pleasure! Oh, Phoebe! That they will resume school on the fifth of next month. Music, embroidery, the backboard, and all the elegancies of the mind. Latin, uh, shall we say algebra? I refuse to write algebra. For beginners. I refuse. There is only one thing I can write. It writes itself in my head all day. Miss Susan Throstle presents her compliments to the Mrs. Willoughby and Miss Henrietta Turnbull, and requests the honour of their presence at the nuptials of her sister Phoebe and Captain Valentine Brown. Susan! A door is heard banging. Phoebe! He has returned! Oh, cruel, cruel! Susan, I am so alarmed! I will face him. Nay, if it must be, I will. But when he enters, he is not very terrible. Miss Phoebe, it is not raining, but your face is wet. I wish always to kiss you when your face is wet. Susan! Miss Livy will never trouble you any more, Miss Susan. I have sent her home. Oh, sir, how can you invent such a story for us? I do not. I invented it for the Mrs. Willoughby and Miss Henrietta, who from their windows watched me put her into my carriage. Patty accompanies her, and in a few hours, Patty will return alone. Phoebe, he has got rid of Livy! Susan, his face hasn't changed. Dear Phoebe Throstle, will you be Phoebe Brown? Phoebe, quivering. You know everything, and that I am not a garden? 
I know everything, ma'am. Except that. Phoebe, so very glad to be prim at the end. Sir, the dictates of my heart enjoin me to accept your too flattering offer. He puts her cap in his pocket. He kisses her. Miss Susan is about to steal away. Oh, sir, Susan also? He kisses Miss Susan also. And here we bid them good-bye. The End End of Act Four and End of Quality Street by J. M. Barrie